whenever these programs begin, I always take the opportunity to just look at all the faces and all the names um, of all the brothers that, that are attending. And I'm just so grateful that there are so many of you that, that, that care about the craft. We've all joined uh, masonry for all different reasons, but many, many of us for the historic, philo philosophic, spiritual, um, and, and brotherly bonds that are found within our lodges. But as we've entered the um, inner door, we understand that in order to make sure that the craft survives and that it thrives, that we must educate ourselves in a whole other aspects um, of, of the Masonic world that we never even imagined. Tonight, we are so grateful to have a, a brother who has spent um, 42 years of his life serving the craft. Um, and as many of you know, that since 1993, Right Worship Brother um, Marino Cesarini has literally taught the Grand Lodge of the City of New York's District Deputy Grand Masters and Staff Officers um, and all these various topics that he's going to be presenting tonight, presented um, last month, and presenting in the future. Um, we're so grateful that he's taken the time out of his busy schedule to, to, to share his knowledge and his um, wisdom with us. Um, right Worship Brother Marino, um, as most of you know, is a past Grand Treasurer. Um, he has served on the Grand Lodge Long Range Planning Committee, on the Constitutions Committee, on the Brotherhood Fund. He is currently the Chief Commission of Appeals. He's a past district deputy from the um, wonderful District of Queens and a proud past master of Corticopia Lodge. I'm so grateful that he has taken the time to, to, to spend with us this evening and the floor is yours, Brother Marino. Thank you, uh, Right Worshipful uh, Steve. And again, I wanna thank you for inviting me uh, this evening to be uh, part of the program. Uh, as we had discussed this evening, what I am going to go over or discuss are some of the most common questions that have been asked by the district deputies and staff officers during their training that were asked to them by the masters and brothers of their lodge. And believe it or not, most of these questions involve issues which take place in basically every lodge on a regular basis. And surprisingly, many brothers really do not know the correct answers to them. Let me first start by, you know, explaining the Book of Masonic Law, because people uh, get a little confused with it. The Book of Masonic Law is actually broken down into six sections. Right? The first section involves the constitutions of the Grand Lodge of the State of New York. Now that only consists of 46 pages. Right? The next section in this book consists of the rules of order. The rules of order is what we follow when we open Grand Lodge session. There is a basic order that must be followed. And if you've ever been down to Grand Lodge session, you'll notice that at times the Grand Master will ask to break away from using the rules of order. And most of the time it's denied, right? Uh, the next section is the Benevolent Orders Law. We as a fraternal organization, like every fraternal organization in the state, no matter which one it is, must or are required to follow certain laws under the benevolence orders laws. Okay, we're required to follow them. We don't have an option. The next one is the code of procedure. As I was for Steve Rubin says, I'm the chief commissioner of appeal. When people go to trial, the code of procedure basically explains to a an individual, what the trial procedure is, what the appeals procedure is, and so forth. So it's important that the masters of a lodge or the brothers are familiar with this. They, they got to realize that it's in here for them to look and try and understand what they are entitled to. Brother Marino, may I just, may I just um, add, as, as most brothers know, I was a proctor for nine years and the judge advocate for three. And I would just like to add that because a lot of brothers, I don't think even know that what, what uh, Right Worship Brother Marino was referring to is that if you commit a Masonic violation 
um, whether it's getting arrested in the profane world or just some other sort of violation within your lodge or in your dealings with the brother Master Mason, you can be brought up on charges. And there's a real process where charges will be entertained or brought against you. And that falls under the, the guise or the direction of the proctor and their regional deputy proctors around the state. But that is what the code of procedure. So the proctor follows the code of procedure and, and, and that was implemented in the 1940s when um, Masonic Lodge discipline was taken out of the lodge and given to Grand Lodge. And that's, and that's where the code of procedure comes from. Right. Well, and you gotta remember the, the next section here, which is amazing because the next uh, section is basically section five, uh, four is, uh, well, actually it's section five. It's the opinions, statutes, decisions, interpretations, rulings, and edicts. That takes that takes up most of this book. That's 355 pages of this book. Everything else has maybe 30 pages, 10 pages, 40 pages. That's it. The final section on this book, which most people totally ignore, is the supplement. And it's important that if you're going to look up a statute in the opinions or in the constitution, that you look at the supplement because it's been tweaked. And I will give you an example in a little while. If something has been tweaked, you have to know about it. Otherwise you're going to make a mistake in assuming that what you read in the opinion is the way it's supposed to be, where it is not. Let me give you a quick example of that. We all know that when you ballot, you can destroy two ballots, correct? On the third ballot, you must, the master must do what? He must announce how that ballot stands. Now, if you look at section five, uh, I believe it's 550. If you look at section 550, it stipulates basically that he is, you know, if something is uh, going on, he can make the, the declaration where if the, let's just say it's the third ballot, the senior warden says it's cloudy, the junior warden says it's clear. It's the third ballot. Now, under the Masonic opinions, the master can make procl proclamation whether it's clear or cloudy. And that's the way it used to be. If you look at the supplement now, it tells you that he cannot make that declaration until he reconciles the discrepancy. Okay? Big difference. You can't reballot because you already had three ballots. But before he can make declaration, he has to reconcile the difference. Brother Marino, can I just add one, one other thing just so that the brothers know where those many multiple pages are coming from. They actually are coming from the Grand Lodge proceedings. So what happens is that while we have the constitutions, it's at Grand Lodge, because as, I, as I've always said, that it's the Grand Lodge that has the authority, the power to make law. When a Grand Master makes, um, passes an edict, it actually dies at the conclusion of his one year term. So for something to be actually become Masonic law, Grand Lodge must pass it. So what Brother Marino is referring to is that if one year uh, a determination was made by a Grand Master and passed by a Grand Lodge in 1944, for example, and then in 1965, they decided to change it, that's where you may have this discrepancy. So clearly we have to kind of update the blue book that, that Brother Marino is holding up, but he's, he's absolutely correct in that it's the supplement that is the more um, up-to-date um, version of the law. And the law is always changing. So in that book, I believe, Brother Marino, when was the last um, updated in 1980 um, um, well, something? Right. The book was, this, the, the current uh, Masonic law book was actually started in roughly 1928. The last time it was updated was 1950 something. I mean, you know, that's a long time ago. Since then, it really has, it really has not been a complete update. It's been supplemented. You'll notice that uh, over the past few years, if you have the Masonic Law Book, you will get uh, pages of updates that have taken place, as Right Watchful Steve said, 
at Grand Lodge session. They will, if you registered when you bought the uh, Masonic Law Book, they will send you the updates that were made at that current year's uh, Grand Session. All right. So again, is it a little bit complicated? Definitely. The present volume is again a complete revision, which uh, you know eliminates uh, uh, and attempts to cover uh, not only the existing law of the craft whether it's found in the Constitution's rule order, code, or procedure, it tried to cover it all. So again, you're still going to find areas that you have to go back and forth. And the other important thing about it, you can't just look at one, uh, one uh, section or one part. You can't just look at Section 520 and not look at all the other parts pertaining to it, because as you will see, one can contradict the other. Right? So let's start, you know, uh, again, the, the one thing that we found and what started all this year, as I explained earlier, when I was chairman of the uh, Leadership and Education Committee, what we used to do is when at breakout sessions, you know, if there were questions, I would say, ask and we will get you the answer. What I started finding was that a lot of the questions that were being asked at different sessions, from training session to training session, were basic questions that you would think brothers would know, that masters would know, and so forth. And it was amazing how it was. And this is how this all started. And that's how we came up with 16 pages that I see that John Serva is on. And John has gone through the training twice up there as a staff officer and as a DD, if I remember correctly. And we used to give it to them at the regionals because it's important that they can relate some of this information to the masses. For example, let's go with petitions. Can a brother or can, let's rephrase that, can an individual withdraw a petition? Right? Now, the answer to that is basically yes, prior to it being, or being declared enlarged, before the secretary reads it enlarged. Important thing, the, the secretary of the, uh, should never read that petition the minute he gets it. Give the individual petitioner one or two weeks to kind of Think about it, if you will, or talk to his family because it's happened where they decided now he told the wife before, uh, you know, he put the petition in before the wife uh, knew about it. And now she's ranting and raving that he's joining a secret cult, a secret society. Right? Wait until two weeks before reading that petition in large. Because once you read that petition, and it only can be read at a stated communication. Once that petition is read in large, that brother and that petition becomes yours. The largest property. No, he cannot seek another lodge. He can't put an application in another lodge. Another lodge can't petition him or, you know, seek him out or so forth. Once that petition is read in large, it must go to its conclusion. By conclusion, it means you must go to an investigating committee. Then from the investigating committee, it must be balloted upon. During that period of time, he cannot withdraw that petition. Okay? That petition is yours. He belongs to you for all intents and purposes. Right? When it, the petition is given to the investigating committee, the investigating committee must consists of not less than three members and who re their report thereon must be in writing in terms of favor uh, favorable or unfavorable and that report cannot be received until at least two weeks after they receive that petition. Okay, a lot of stuff that seems unimportant as it goes on, it does get important. 
for, exa for example, if that petition, if there's a mistake on that petition, once you read it in large, and even though you know there's a there's a mistake or he did something wrong on that petition, it can't be withdrawn. It has to go to conclusion. Even though you know there's something wrong with it, it must go to its conclusion, which is a ballot. All right. Once it's acted upon, if it's favorable, goes on. If it's unfavorable and he gets blackballed, once you're blackballed, that blackball is not reconcilable. That's it. For 12 months, as you all know. Right? When that report is received, the names of the people on the investigating committee and whether they just whether they tell you it's favorable or unfavorable does not go in the minutes book. Nowhere does it go in the minutes book. And yet people, I've seen it, I've done, when I've done, uh, when I was DD and you go and uh, check the books, all of a sudden, yeah, Joe so-and-so, uh, you know, uh, voted no, or, you know, uh, voted unfavorable or, or said unfavorable. It's no one's business because that, their recommendation means absolutely nothing. It is simply a recommendation to you. The final recommendation comes by you voting, by the members voting. Right? Brother Marino, may I just interject one thing? Sure. Um, with, with the North Star program, obviously some of the issues that you were initially raised, like reading the petition too soon, hopefully will be negated because now you've gone, gone much slower. As an interesting note that years ago, that type of process of slowing down the process just did not exist. I mean, a petition was handed in and it was read and kind of balloted yeah, upon it just, so quickly. It just went, you know, by yeah. fast and most people didn't realize that you're, you're bound by certain regulations. And again, all it takes is one individual to say to you, hey, you screwed up and bring you up on charges. And again, you as a proctor can testify how many times people will bring thing, people up on charges with by things that they never even knew mattered. I, pl I plead the fifth. Okay, so there again, once that once it becomes back favorable, he can withdraw that petition. You can't deny it. if he writes a letter to your lodge and says, "I decided that I really don't want to become a mason," or "I decided I want to put my petition in to a different lodge," you can't deny him that right. He has the right to withdraw a petition once it's been voted on. It's voted favorable. He has the right to ask for a withdrawal and apply to another lodge if he so desires. All right. A, withdraw a, a request for a withdrawal has to be in writing and it can be by a hand vote of the members. Uh, the investigating committee Again, I said there had to be three. Now here's another little clinker, which not most people don't know. If only two members of the investigating committee report and the master decides to ballot on that petition, what happens? If only two people have signed off on that petition, and he is blackballed, the blackball stands. If he is voted favorable, that petition, that vote is void. It does not count. Right? So you got to be careful because it could take only two people saying, you know, that can sign the petition. And if he is for whatever reason blackballed, that that stands as a blackball. He cannot, he, if, he's, if he's rejected, he cannot repetition for 12 months. But if he's elected, if he's voted unfavorable, it's no good. He's got to have that third investigation. Okay? So again, you have to realize there are repercussions to everything. 
if you go to balloting, again, the same thing holds true with balloting. People forget that you are, that you have, a lot of people, believe it or not, and I had it in my own larger, I guess it must've been about four years ago. You know, some brothers read the, uh, the constitution, they see certain issues. And if you look in the constitution, it still tells you that it only requires one black ball or cube to reject. You have to go to the supplement where it tells you it's three, right? So we had that same issue that I gave you the example of before, that when they, the master asked for them to report one, the gentleman, the brother was a junior warden, he says uh, cloudy, and the senior warden said clear, you know, because again, they didn't know. As I said to you, you cannot make that declaration until you reconcile it. So the question that always comes up, well, how do I reconcile it if I've already, it's the third ballot, you can't revoke, what must you do? You have to reread the second where, where you stip, you tell them, you're about to exercise one of your most sacred rights as a master mason, go through the whole thing and emphasize, it takes three black balls or cubes to reject a petitioner, right? And then ask them to send it out to be re invested, you know, uh, reviewed. If it comes back the same as before, if one guy says cloudy, one, uh, one warden says clear, now you can make declaration. And whatever your declaration is, it is. There's no arguments. There's no discussion. It's what it is. Right? So again, if you go to balloting, it's important that you know how to ballot and when to ballot. It's just like a collective ballot. Is collective balloting a good idea? Most of the times, there's not, there, there, there are very few issues. However, we've had instances where, again, you have four or five, this one large had six individuals they were balloting on. And it turns out that they got a, they were, it came as a black ball a cube on the first, the three black balls a cube on the first petition, on the first round. Now, because it was collective, you've now got to do two individual rounds because you cannot reject on a collective ballot. Under the Constitution, you cannot reject on a collective ballot. So now you have to ballot individually. And a lot of people, if you notice, in many of the lodges, they'll, if you do it now individually, they'll say, okay, we're gonna ballot on Mr. Steve Rubin for the second time. And what happens is they pass him, okay. Well, well and good. Now, the next guy comes around. Hello, Brother Cliff. They're going to vote on Brother Cliff Jacobs. Right? And they're going to say it's going to be rejected. Now, he destroys that ballot and does another ballot on Brother Cliff Jacobs. Good or bad? It's really bad because you should give them a chance to go through the other brothers for their second ballot and then come back to Cliff. Because there is a section in here and I hate reading it because people take it the wrong way. But there, there is a section in here which basically tells you that if a second ballot is required after a negative collective ballot. And if, if it's not held forthwith, it can be done at the next communication, but it has to, they have that communication 
has a communication has to go out uh, stating that it is a state of communication for that purpose, right? So again, I don't like going into that because people start saying, okay, I can break the sequence of order, right? You really shouldn't. But if you have six or seven guys, and you know, again, like I said, if you do all five for a second ballot, by the time you get done for that third ballot or that third round on each individual, it could be late. You actually can postpone that to the next meeting. Brother Muirin, if I would just chime in for a second, because there was a brother that posed a question in the chat. I want you to just address before you move on. And there's a question about, you know, cloudy, can the worship master overturn that? And the answer is no, the worship master only has one vote like everyone else. Correct. It's just that the worship master and the wardens are declaring Basically, what the, the result of the of the of the election is by cl saying cloudy or not or, or 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 clear. Right. You know, as I said, he only has the one vote, but his final vote, when he's the he, you must remember that the master is the only one who can make declaration, and his declaration is word. That's it. Like I said. If they vote and if they swear to it that a hey, one is cloudy, one is clear, and he says it's clear, it's clear. Right at that point, he has had it. You may also recall some of the older members that it used to be that you would destroy that ballot before asking the wardens whether it was cl clear or cloudy, because it used to be if they announced it, you had to make the announcement because it was already made. If you look at that section of the constitution now, and then look at the supplement to it, it tells you that you can, that you can still destroy that ballot, even though the wardens declared it as to what it was, he still has the right to destroy it and heard and have that next ballot. That's why, again, it's important to look at the supplements. Okay. The one I want to go to one section here, which is also been a, a lot of confusion in a lot of the training sessions and a lot of uh, the th uh, places I've gone to give the talk on, and that's the difference between an objection and a rebalance. And it's important, okay? If an individual is going to be called in, if you're going to do the first degree, the master asks, if there is no objection, I shall confer the degree upon you, All right? Brother John Server gets up, I object. The master, at that point in time, stops the proceeding. The degree has ended. There will be no degree. Can you have discussion as to why of the, the objection? No, because under the Constitution, it stipulates that we cannot discuss the petitioner in the lodging. Well, he can. The Marino? Yeah. Let, me, let me throw out a question to you. What, because I've had, heard this question before from other brothers, I want to get your input on this. If um, you're having um, three brothers for the entered apprentice degree, and the same question is asked, and it's an objection, but it really is only for one of the brothers, how would you handle that? It, all, it, it completely ends. It completely ends because it may just be the guy has a little pet peeve. You can't rule one over the other. You, you're not gonna, it, 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 it ends. The degree for that evening ends. There will be no degree, all right? If another, you, que another question was asked and it's, it's pertinent for this. I know the answer, but I want to get your opinion. Um, can it only be a master mason of the lodge or can it be any okay. person present that can object? Here's the kicker. On an objection, it can be any brother of the lodge or any brother of a sister lodge. Now, the way I interpret the sister lodge 
because that's what it says in the Constitution, is a sister lodge in our jurisdiction, in the state of New York. So if you get, if an individual, I've known Cliff for ages, right? If Cliff comes to my lodge and he's a member of uh, which lodge, you, well, you still member of, of uh, service? I, w I used to be Service City Giba, but that's changed now. But if he comes to my lodge and he objects, I have to entertain that objection. Even though he is not a member of the lodge, he is a member of a lodge in the, uh, or a sister lodge in our jurisdiction. So he has the right to object. If I refuse to entertain his objection, I can be brought up on Masonic charges. I cannot refuse the objection of a brother from a sister lodge, right? So now you ended the degree that night. The brother doesn't want to tell you why he's objecting. He doesn't have to, right? So you schedule the degree for the next meeting. The next meeting, the same individual at the subsequent meeting, the same individual, Brother Cliff Jacobs gets up and says, I object. I, as the master now under the constitution, have the right to ignore that objection and continue on with the degree. If a different brother objects, now you got a little bit of a problem here. Now the master has to make a determination. Does he want to continue with the degree? Because now it's a different brother objecting. And he has an option here. And the option is he can ask for a re, you know, ask, do you want to ask for a reballot? Okay. But the only person who can ask for a reballot is who? A member of the lodge. So Cliff cannot ask for a reballot. There's a big difference there. Any brother of the lodge or a sister lodge can object, but only a member of the lodge can ask for a reballot. Right? And if a reballot if a reballot is asked for, it must be taken then and there. Now remember, you can only ballot supposedly at a stated communication, correct? The only time there's an exception to that rule is if you call the special meeting for the purpose of conferring the degree and the person asks for a reballot at that meeting, you must reballot at that meeting. That's the only time you can take a ballot as something other than at a stated communication. Brother Marino, can I just add something? And I want to. Um just make, it, make an announcement. Um, um, after I make my comment, I would I ask uh, Brother Jim Roberts, who has his hand raised, to um, to ask the question, because it must be pertinent towards what you're addressing. And if brothers have been putting questions in the chat, if they would like to ask it directly, if they just raise their hand, which is that little reaction signal in the lower right-hand corner, we will see it, and, and, and myself and other brothers working with me at tonight's program We'll, we'll get the question out. We'll, we'll call upon you so you can address it to Brother Marino. Any I'd just like to add, if I, if I could just add one thing, Brother Marino, before we call on Brother Jim, is that some questions have been asked about the Grand Mass, um, you know, um, does Grand Lodge get involved in this process about selecting, you know, about candidates and, 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 and addressing the qualifications of candidates? And the answer, is that historically that prerogative has always been left up to the lodge. However, the Grand Master always has the right to stop any candidate's progression in the craft. And what's happened is that now that we have the guarding the West Gate, which is the background checks, so that, you know, the question is if a brother has, if, if a candidate has a felony on his record, can he become a Master Mason? And the answer is technically, Yes, because you don't have a blanket prohibition in New York Masonic law. And once again, this is the Grand Lodge in New York, and I know there's some Prince Hall brothers here, so your laws may be different. 
But because of the fact that now the grandmaster is being aware of uh, those those red flags of of, of a candidate with uh, conviction on his record, the grandmaster might unilaterally say that that candidate cannot move forward. But in theory, master masons believe in redemption, um, and, um, and and if, a, if an individual had a, 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 a crime years ago, but is you know found the Lord and found a way, um, in theory he could still become a master mason. Yeah, it is. It's basically up to the lodge to make that determination. I mean, realistically, uh, again, uh, I, I would hope the lodges, and I will give you a perfect example. Approximately four years ago, a lodge came up to me and asked me a question. Uh, they had an individual who petitioned their lodge, and he was very honest on the petition where he admitted to having been arrested and having been a member of MS-13, all right? And the member of this lodge asked me, uh, is it okay? I said, you know, that's something you as a lodge have to make the decision on. You can't ask an individual's opinion that, because I would tell you right then and there, no. Why would I even entertain an individual who admits to having been a gang member to join the lodge, right? But that's my personal opinion. You as a lodge and the members of the lodge must make that determination. Right? Brother Mirren, if I, just, if I just may add that, that you're absolutely correct and that I agree with that, once again, because of now the Garden of the West Gate, I suspect that the Grand Master would probably put a stop on that immediately. Yeah, what I, I will add. What I will add, just if I just may, Brother Marino, is that it is a number of years ago, the only blanket prohibition for anyone with a, something on his record was a sex offense. So if a, if a candidate has is a, is, a, is a sex offense, is on the sex offense registry, that individual cannot be a Master Mason. So that was oh. passed several years ago in Grand Lodge. Right. And I believe that's still in effect right now uh, because you do stay on that uh, sex offender list for 25 years. So, uh, Brother Marino, can we just call Brother Jim Roberts? He has his hand raised for a while. I'm sure he wants to ask you a question. Brother Jim? It was Brother Marino. Uh, the question I had was regarding uh, the reasoning behind allowing brothers from other lodges um, to object. And I would conjecture that that's because we as Masons uh, want to reach out for every possibility of information that may uh, show light on a potential brother. Correct. Is that the reasoning? Yeah, that's basically the reason. If he's a member of this lodge, you know, I mean, especially today, let's be very, let's be very realistic. Even with the North Star program today, how many members are we getting in that we really don't personally know? I mean, you know, the, I, let, me re, let me regress for a second. There is, I always, when, I, when Jim, you went through the training also, when we did this here, the one thing I always started out with was certification signed by members of the lodge. No petition, whether for initiation or affiliation, and this is on the top of every petition. All affiliation shall be received unless it is signed by a member of the lodge to which he, it is addressed, certifying that he is well acquainted with the petitioner, that he has read the answers to the questions contained in the petition and believes them to be true, and that the petitioner is of good character and reputation and comes under a tongue of good repute. Remember, when you sign that petition for that brother to come in your lodge, this is what you're signing. This is what you're saying. It's on the top of every petition. All right? Today, we kind of not bypass it, but do we really know whether he comes under a tongue of good repute? Is he really a man of a character? I mean, let's be very realistic. Do we know an individual by meeting with him four, five, six times? Do we really know what his character is? It's very difficult today. The, the guarding the West Gate help. But again, uh, you have to be careful. And that's why, yes, on an objection is pretty much left open to 
anyone basically in our jurisdiction, our grand jurisdiction. And again, you can ask for an objection before every degree. Doesn't mean you can only do it prior to the first degree. You can object prior to the second degree and prior to the third degree. And what's important is to reballot. You can ask for a reballot before every degree. Okay? And if you do get ask for a reballot, and that reballot comes up negative or as a rejection, right? If it's after the if it's prior to the first degree, that rejection is as if he was rejected when you initially voted on. It. If it's prior to the first degree and a brother asks for a reballot and he gets blackballed, he now is out of the picture for the next 12 months. Okay, it's just like if he was originally rejected. Brother Marino, let me ask you a question to follow up on that question. And I want to ask a couple of brothers to, to ask some questions that they have had their hands raised. So after 12 months, that that brother, let's say it's after the fellow craft degree, and he no, is no. now voted. After, after, if he gets that rejection prior to the first degree, it's 12 months. If you get a black ball after taking the first degree and prior to the second degree or prior to the third degree, okay? What happens there is that the master can now ask for a reballot or can reballot on this candidate at every meeting for six months. At the end of that six months, if he is still, if he still has not gotten a approval, if he keeps getting a rejection, that brother, because he is a brother now, that brother has the right to pull that petition or that, from that lodge and apply to another lodge in our jurisdiction. Okay, there's a difference. As and said, so it, is, it, it, it should, does the lodge have to advertise that it's going to be a vote each and every single time thereafter? You don't have to advertise at all. It's not, you know, like I said, the only the only question it basically asks is there's an objection. What most brothers don't know is that you have the right, it's not a privilege. You as a brother have a right to demand a reballot of any individual candidate at any given time during the conferral of those degrees. Brother Marino, let me stop you for there for a moment. Um, Brother Cliff Jacobs, I saw, right where Brother Cliff Jacobs, I saw you had your hand raised physically do you have a question for um, Brother Marino? Well, I had a question, but I, I just want to share something interesting that happened during my time as master. Um, I was in the position of uh, a grand master owed me a personal favor, so he was coming to visit my lodge to give out awards. And I wanted to make him an honorary member. Um, but honorary membership, you still have to ballot. And the members of my lodge told me, we're going to blackball him. We will not make him an me honorary member. Correct. So, what happened was um, we compromised. They said, we'll give him a check for $1,000. But I didn't realize that um, honorary memberships, even for a grandmaster, you still have to hold the ballot. Not it's even you must hold the ballot. It must be unanimous. Yeah. If you give honorary membership to any brother, okay, honorary membership to any brother, it must be a, human a unanimous vote. If there is one black ball or cube in that ballot, you can't give that individual honorary membership. So the three unanimous. The three cube rule doesn't apply there, just one? No. Honorary membership, it must be unanimous. Right? Brother Marino, uh, I would like to call brother a uh, right worship brother John Server. Wonderful to see you, brother John. Um, you have a, your hand raised. You have to unmute yourself, brother. There we go. Uh, right, wonderful, Marino. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you again, Brother John. Um, if we ballot on a petition and it takes three times and it's still cloudy, 
could at the next meeting somebody call for a reballot? No. As I said before, a black ballot, all right, a, a rejection is non reconcilable. Okay. Okay. You can ask for a reballot at the lodge, all right, after the, let, let's say, just prior to him taking that first degree. Right. Okay. Now it comes up that you get a black, three black balls of cube. Now all of a sudden, uh, Brother Matthew Weiss says, I want to reballot on that. It's already been, he's gotten three black balls of cube. He's been rejected. You cannot reballot on that rejection. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The only time you can do that is, like I said, after you get the degrees and between each degree, okay, you can ask for a reballot and it goes on for a period of six months. And during that six months, if you don't get a clear ballot, he can ask to withdraw his petition from your lodge and he can now apply to another lodge. But he's got to put down at that lodge when he puts it, when he applies for it and puts in the petition, the reason he's applying to that lodge and that he's gotten the first degree at the other lodge, they may still require him to take the first degree in the new lodge that he petitioned. Okay, thank you for clearing that up. As I said, there's, it's, it's not that it's difficult. The hardest thing about the Constitution for Masonic law is you got to take the time to read every section that is associated with it. Right? You can't go to just one section. Another example, can a master or warden resign or demit? Yes. Okay, I see Cliff shaking his head. And I see this, and John's saying yes. Okay, here's the key factor. If you look in the Book of Constitution at Masonic in, in the opinions, I believe it's section nine something, I don't remember now, 920, and then the two sections for the wardens. In the opinion section, it tells you that you cannot resign or demit. Okay, if you look at the supplement, it tells you that yes, he can demit. The right to demit is the right of any master mason under the constitution and under section 132, I believe C it is. So it's 130 something, I think it's 132 C. It states that the right to demit is the right of any brother. That includes the master. He can't resign. But if he wants to admit from the fraternity, if he wants to admit from his lodge, you can't stop him. If he doesn't want to admit and no longer wants to be the master or the wardens of the lodge, tough to noogies, you will remain the master and the warden of that lodge. Even though you don't attend the meetings, even though let's say the uh, senior warden is gonna have to open for you, that's all well and good but you cannot resign the master or the warden. It's just, let's go one step further because we've had this discussion with a few wardens about a, 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 this certain incident. Let's say the master passes away, he dies. The option under the constitution is what? That the senior warden becomes what? Acting master. All right. Does that mean that the junior warden moves up to senior warden? No. He was elected junior warden. That is his chair. The, ju the acting master can assign anyone to fill the chair of the senior warden. Let us now say that the grand master says, okay, I get, I'm going to call your district deputy. And I'm going to tell him he can have a special election to elect a new master. Can 
the master, again, the warden, the junior or senior warden, be elected to the station of master. Let me, by show of hand, how many say yes? How many say no? The answer is no. He's been elected to a position of senior warden and junior warden. If the grandmaster gives them permission to hold an election for a worshipful master, they cannot run for that office. They already hold an elected position. The constant, like I said, my brothers, I love, you know, I started playing with this book about 30 years ago. And once I got started with it, and Cliff will tell you, because I've known him almost that long. Once you get started, and once you get your nose wet and you get your thing going, it's amazing how you start to look things every time something comes to mind. And that's the only way you're going to learn what's in here. All right? So the thing is, you know, when we take, when every master gets installed, what we, what's the one, th one thing that we present them? The Constitution, the con we, we tell them, the, Const the Constitutions you are to search at all times. Cause them to be read in your lodge, that none can pretend in ignorance and the precept it enjoins. I'm going to ask you the next time you go to any lodge, look at the secretary's desk, look in the east, you tell me how many secretaries or how many things in the East has this book on it, so they can look at it. I will wager that at least 70% of the lodges you go to, this book is nowhere in sight. And that's kind of, and that's kind of a, a sad uh, thing to, excuse me, let me just shut this off. I think that's kind of, I think that's kind of a sad scenario that you're telling me that this book which governs everything we do in Freemasonry that it's not on the secretary's desk in case a question comes up and you're going to give the guy you're going to give that uh, the master a wrong answer uh, you know it's our responsibility as Master Mason to make sure that things are not changed arbitrarily. I mean, change is good. I know sometimes we have to tweak certain things. And I, you know, what's, what's beautiful about this here, the people that wrote this book starting back in 1928 understood that. And believe it or not, if you look at it the way it's written, they allow for you to tweak certain things without changing it. Right? It's, there, there's ways of doing it. And there's ways of doing things that you think you cannot do, that you can do it. If you read this book and understand it, the sad part about it is, like so many other things today, when it comes to the Constitution, people try to make changes to suit their purpose, what's advantageous for them. Not, you know, this book has been helpful to us for how many decades? Hundreds of years, actually. Well, well, if you go back, yeah, it's hundreds of years. This is, you know, they didn't put it all together like into one volume until 1928. But before that, we had it, and it served our purpose. So we can't say that what's in there doesn't work because times have changed. We know times change. Times will continue to change. But does that mean we change the basic concepts and principles that hold this fraternity together? And this is one of the things that holds this fraternity together because we're governed by, if you think about it, if someone does something wrong, we have a judicial system here. Steve, you're a lawyer. Is this judicial systems just as 
proper, if you will, and as effective as civil court? It is, but but just to address what you're saying, that a lot, some of these, some of the provisions have been tweaked over the years, and that's a healthy thing as well to do. And you can even see that's why there's a supplement because times do change, laws do get modified. But I believe that your ultimate point in that is our brethren have to understand how the important it is to understand these concepts because you may give a great middle chamber lecture. But if you don't understand these concepts and you want to be a leader of your lodge or your district, you're going to fail. And 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 there's there's a you know and so these are the provisions that we must follow. I would just like to ask um, right brother Remington to ask a question of you, brother Marino. He's had his hand raised for some time. Brother Remington. Well, right worshipful. Uh, once again, thanks for uh, knocking my head around. Uh, <laughs> in a good way uh, back in 2008 so that, uh, <laughs> you know uh that little blue well that big blue book uh kind of got uh instilled you saved my butt quite 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 a bit that that year um speaking of which i get a burning question once in a while from uh from uh, uh past and sitting master everybody's got their own ideas about something but in this has nothing to do with balloting it has to do with uh constitutions 309 and uh statute 1005 in terms of the powers of the master especially subparagraph three uh in regards to the master's supervision of the secretary okay. if if uh, coming up against resistance, what is the enforcement behind that power? Okay, he can, being the, the secretary is an elected member of the lodge. The master cannot arbitrarily replace him. Okay, if he has uh, you know major conflicts with him, uh, he could ask him to resign. Will he? Maybe not, probably not. Let's put it that way. The only thing you can do then is, you know, basically ask Grand Lodge to have a re-election on it, which I don't think you get, you're going to get. Uh, you, unless, the only thing you can do is, you have to remember, if you look at the, de at the duties of a secretary and the duties of a treasurer, there, specify in detail it's just like when i was grand treasurer and when steve was grand treasurer and you have the grand secretary our duties are specified in the constitution what we are required to do and how we're and you know what we're supposed to do if we do not do it then we can be brought up on charges or the bond that was established to be revoked and so forth. So here again, those two chairs have certain duties and responsibilities. If the master and that secretary are bumping heads because of personalities, then they're gonna have to reconcile it among themselves. If he is doing the job that he's supposed to do, then, you know, what is the issue? Do they have personal differences? I don't know. You tell me, Robin. No, I'm just looking in general, uh, since it says it is the master's responsibility to it supervise is. the secretary yes, he is. He is to he get is reports completed. Right. If the reports aren't getting completed, that's all I was asking if there yeah, was some the enforcement report, behind it. Well, the enforcement is, again, if uh, I'm gonna hate to get technical here and I hate doing this, but okay. By reports, exactly what are we talking about? Are we talking reports that they're required to send to Grand Lodge? Or are we talking reports that they are giving to the Lodge? Uh, reports giving to the Lodge, which would affect what would be sent to Grand Lodge? Well, yes and no. But see, my, here's my concern. The reports that have to go to Grand Lodge on this, are a necessity because without those reports, without the uh, certificate of election, 
without the uh, annual uh, report, you will not vote at Grand Lodge session. If many as I'm sure that many of your lodges in your district probably have already received the letter from Clara that they may not have submitted their 990s or their certificate of election or their annual reports. All right. So technically, if we had Grand Lodge session on, they wouldn't be able to uh, vote. Now, if he didn't do those reports in Lodge, then the master has a right to bring him up on Masonic charges for not doing the what is required to do. So, you know, you kind of, you got to, you know, kind of be very specific as to, okay, what is he not doing? I just may chime in there. I, I would agree completely with Brother Marino, and I think that the question is a good one because over the years we do see sometimes where there is a problem in the personalities between the officers. But the answer is that Brother Marino is, is, is saying is that while the, the worship master is, is the buck stops with the worship master in the lodge, nevertheless, the worship master does not have the authority to remove an elected officer. An appointed officer, yes, but not an elected officer. And the point is, and if, if the elected officer, however, is violating some sort of um, a Masonic duty that he has pursuant to his office or just engaging in other sort of unmasonic conduct, then the direction that the, that the worship master has, just like any brother, is to, is to refer the question to the Grand Master, bring up in charges. The Grand Master, remember, always has the authority to suspend a brother from his office right. of any lodge. So if if the, if, the, if the secretary of your lodge is really acting, acting inappropriately, whether it was on the verge of, and it was appropriate to bring Masonic charges, nevertheless, the, the Grand Master could always suspend that officer and you could then thereafter appoint another officer for that position. So those are kind of your options. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm kind of more the mediator type guy. You know, I used to do labor repping and uh, just of wondered if you have there the was something... Tail. Yeah, at a lower the, level, <laughs> the, the is, again, that, that could be done to just say, "Hey, I just need this report completed. That's it." Correct. You know? it, now um, remember, uh, don't let it like to escalate. You know? if, he, if he asks that of that secretary, and the secretary tells him, mm -mm, "Now he can bring him up on charges," because the worshipful master is giving you a direct, I'm not going to say order, but requests, okay? And that's something you would have to comply with. So again, you, you have to make sure that the personalities don't overtake it because you have to justify your actions when you do bring it to Grand Lodge. Like page 50, don't get into uh, peaks and prejudices. Thank right. you. Once again, uh, your, your sage advice is uh, always welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Brother Marita, once you move on, and then I'm going to call on brother, um, um, another brother who has his hand raised in just another moment. All right. Again, now, like I said, we can go on to uh, signing the bylaws. What happens if you don't sign the bylaws? You must sign the bylaws. Our constitution hasn't changed. There is, you've heard the statements, unaffiliated and non-affiliated. And most masters and most brothers and lodges, if you ask them to give you uh, the difference or to tell you the difference of the two, they can't. Right? And it's important that you do know it because a non-affiliated individual is a brother who demits from a lodge or if that lodge has merged or consolidated with another lodge, right? But he doesn't want to be a part of that lodge, right? He demits or he does not affiliate with that lodge. For one year, that individual brother has the right to attend other lodge meetings to see, you know, if there's a lodge he wishes to affiliate with. But that can go on for only one year. After that one year, if he 
does not affiliate with a lodge, he becomes an unaffiliated Mason and he cannot attend any meetings and he can attend no right and no uh no meetings he can't attend any technically any functions or whatever because he's unaffiliated he's no he's not no longer he is similar to being dropped for non-payment of dues for no other words so there is a difference there all right and it's important that you understand that difference because if a brother is dropped for non-payment of dues he's got a right for a year to actually visit other lodges and see what lodge he wants to affiliate. If a brother demits, just because he, you gave him that demit, it doesn't mean he doesn't have a right now to affiliate. He's demitted from your lodge. He may not want to demit from Masonry. He just wanted to demit from his lodge, that your lodge. So he has a year to look around. Brother Marino, if I just may add as well that what's important for brothers to know, in fact, this just came up recently in, in a concordant body in, in Royal Arch, that Royal Arch and, and uh, our other uh, concordant bodies within the Grand Lodge and uh, within the state of New York, you know, follow the, the constitutions. Of, uh, other, of course, have to follow their own constitutions, but will also look towards with deference to the Grand Lodge constitutions. So if you are um, um, non-affiliated, as, as Brother Marino just indicated, so that you are no longer a member of a lodge, you've admitted, you don't have, you're not a membership in any lodge. For one year, you're still in good standing. You can travel around to any lodge within the city of New York or any, any state, but it, it, as well as you still have the right to participate in your concordant bodies, Royal Arch and the like. Yeah. After that one year period, at, even in the Grand Lodge, uh, Grand Chapter constitutions, you know, Royal Arch, you, um, lose your right to participate in these concordant bodies um so you the same sort of negative effect after that one year will 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 befall you right. you get you get the concordant bodies yeah yeah you have to remember it, 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 it they work one 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 hand in another uh but again if you drop for non-payment of dues you know again we we come that uh to the question, and this just came up just recently, believe it or not, I got a call from a, uh, uh, a district in Manhattan in reference to this here, and that is if an individual has been dropped for non-payment of dues for five or more years, what is the procedure for him to be reinstated? Okay. Now, if it's under five years and you will drop for non-payment of dues, the one, one thing you have to do is you have to look at your own bylaws, all right? And that's important. You have to remember the bylaws uh, is a contract between you and your lodge, and that's the way it's stated in the Constitution. It's a contract between the member and the lodge. So long as those bylaws do not contradict the Constitution, they take precedence. In other words, if I, if I, in, I in my particular bylaw, it says that if an individual is dropped for non payment of dues and he wants to re affiliate with us, he must pay two years back dues plus the current year. All right now, if he does that and it's under five years, he can be voted back into the lodge by the vote of a hand. Okay, if it's five years or more, he must be balloted upon. And again, depending on your bylaws, how much does he have to pay back? Is it just two years? plus the current year, right? The, it, the call I got was the fact that they may not have that in their bylaws. And the master was trying to have the large vote that they waive 
any back dues of these brothers who've been dropped for over five years, six, seven, eight years, whatever. So I told him, you know, you're on, you're on shaky grounds there, okay? Because number one, you got to see what your bylaws say. Number two, you can't make a change to your bylaws by a vote of the lodge without holding, giving them, you know, sending them the copy of your bylaws at two uh, meeting notices and then calling a summon communication to change on those bylaws. So, like I said, you got to be very careful what you do there and what your bylaws say. But again, if it's more than five years, you're supposed to actually be ballot upon. And the way I look at it and the way it kind of reason, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say you must, but if the guy's been out for 10 years, well, I know he's been 10 years in prison. So after 10 years, he's supposed to put in a new application. He doesn't have to put, give you a new initiation fee, but he's supposed to put in a new application, a new petition, and he's supposed to be balloted upon that. By vote by a show of hands. Brother so, Marino, may I ask a question? Is, is, the, is the vote, whether it's by ballot or by hand, is that a majority? It's a majority? By, well, it, the way it says in there, if it's by, it's supposed to, if it's over five years, it's by ballot. The ballot must be unanimous. Okay? If it's under the five years, again, it can be done by a show of hands and it's unanimous. That's by unanimous vote, okay? But by ballot, it's supposed to be unanimous. I would like to just remind everyone as well that if a brother is um, dropped for, for, for non-payment of, uh, of their dues and they pay all those back dues, regardless of what the, your bylaws say or if your bylaws don't talk about it, but they pay and they're up to date, Ultimately, if they are not voted back in, as Brother Marino is talking about, then they become non-affiliated if they're not also a member of another lodge, and then they can apply for membership in another lodge. So if someone pays, so if someone pays back their their pay, their their old dues, and they're no longer non-affiliated, uh, NPD, they're non-affiliated, excuse me, unaffiliated, um, but they still have the obligation to then be, take a vote upon, at their lodge, and if the lodge doesn't want them back. The lodge could vote to not have them back into their lodge, and then they would have to search out another lodge. Another point I just want to make is that when a lot when someone asks for a demit, what it really even is saying is that it's like a certificate of good standing in a sense. Right. So that's why our, our constitution says, our Masonic law says that if you have Masonic charges brought against you, you cannot ask for a demit. So all of a sudden you've gotten caught for doing some really bad things, and you want to start, you know, you know, and charges are brought against you. You can't demit you just get to run away from the situation here. And, I, and as, as I've always said, that I think the issue is that we want to address those problems at, at the root, at the time, and not be, kind of push it to, to another lodge. And so if there's a problem, there are Masonic charges, the brother is not permitted to demit because once again, he's not taking that piece of paper, going to another lodge, another jurisdiction and saying, I'm in good standing, which ultimately he may have Masonic charges brought against him for the reason why he hasn't assigned charges. And there's something else with that, Steve. I'm, br I'm glad you brought it up because again, this is another call I got last week, believe it or not. If a brother leaves a lodge and wants to affiliate with another lodge, or even just if a brother wants to affiliate with another lodge and he is had owes dues or is indebted, has indebted, indebtedness to someone in that lodge, you cannot accept that petition because technically he is not a member in uh, good standing. He owes money to individuals of that lodge. If he's indebted to them for some reason, you cannot accept that petition. One, one, uh, one other thing I'd like to actually add is, it's, I think it's the important point and that is that, because we're gonna have balloting in lodges coming up soon. So lodges have the ability to have in their own bylaws, a provision that says, if you've not, if you're not up to your due, up, caught up to your dues, you can be prevented from voting in that election in your lodge. However, 
the moment that that brother pays up his dues, including, you know, at that lodge meeting where the vote's going to take place, he has to be permitted to, to um, the right to, um, to vote. But here's the interesting thing. Even if a brother was um, owed on his back dues, as long as he's not NPD'd, he, and, and even though the bylaws of the lodge may say that he can't vote himself in the election, he still is able to run for office within the lodge. Not if he owes dues. That's not right. If that he owes dues, dues. He's not, if he if he owes if he don't if he owes dues, a member in prevented good from state. voting. If he owes dues, he still is able to run for office because the only prevention from running for office is that you're in good standing, and good standing only right. means. But if your if your bylaws stipulate, see here here's a clicker. The Grand Lodge Constitution states that in order to be a member in good standings you have to be what you have to have received your first second and third degree you cannot have been convicted of a crime or a crime pending and you cannot and uh, you do not what was the other one uh you have to take the first second and third degree you cannot have uh any charges pending there was something else. That's what that's what the Constitution says or stipulates as a member in good standings. Again, what your bylaws of your large state are two different things. And I will give you a, an example. All right, we had this happen. Uh, Cliff will remember the Old Forest Hills Lodge. Okay, the Old Forest Hills Lodge. They used to be there. All right, if Their bylaws was very specific. It stipulated that in order to be a member in good standings, you are you had to be paid up to a date with your dues. Now you have to be that current year. You had to be paid up to date, right? And there was something else to it. Uh, there was one other thing, but that, uh, but but that's what it constitutes. So well, again, it his their bylaws did not contradict Grand Lodge's definition of good standing. It basically enhanced it where it says they must be up to date. And uh, I'm sorry, their thing says to run for office. That's what was in their bylaws. So you've got to be kind of. You know, I, I, you know, I, I, I see that brother, uh, worshipful brother, I'm not sure if he's very worshipful yet, uh, Michael LaRocca has made the same comment. I'm not so sure that that's accurate, and I'd like to follow up this another time, yeah. because the definition of the, and I've not looked at this section in quite some time, thank goodness I'm no longer the judge advocate or the proctor, uh, but it's been a pleasure not having to crack that book open as much as you have to for those positions, but in the constitutions itself, it says what the definition of good standing is. Yes. And as such, another, uh, it, it, let me just say this to you. I personally believe that what Brother Michael LaRocca's Lodge says and what you just referred to is accurate. I believe that if a brother owes money in, to dues, that, that it's not inappropriate for a lodge to say he has to run, that he can't run for office in, within his lodge. However, I'm not so sure that that's current Masonic, the correct Masonic law. For, once again, my, my point is that our constitution gives a definition of what good standing means and as such as long as that brother is in good standing he's entitled to run for office and that's pursuant to the grand lodge constitution's definition and and a lodge is not able to tweak that definition of good standing and so i i will i think that that law should be changed quite frankly my personal opinion is that 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 the Grand Lodge, you know, provision saying what good standing is dictates and controls in the situation here. But um, yeah, you, you're, pro you're probably right, my worship, because again, some of these things have to be updated, if you will. I uh, hypothetically, it's just like uh, there's a section of the Constitution where can a master be dropped for non-payment of dues? Can a master be dropped for non-payment of dues? 
The answer is no. Okay. And if he has been, we had this incident a number of years back, this individual master, there was no one in his lodge to run for office. All right. So he had been, he was master for, I think, going on four years. And he was four years in arrears on his dues. Now, you can't drop him for non payment of dues because it says until a successor has been duly elected and installed in your state. Well, no one's running for his daughter, so he's in there for that point in time. But I, looking something up, I found that if he was a dual member of a lodge and he is dropped for non-payment of dues in that other lodge, as master, he is now dropped from that lodge. I think Silvio Berlusconi in Italy did it, was trying to follow the same sort of thing about um, staying in office. Um, I see Brother uh, Right Worship Brother uh, Robert Remington has has his hand up. Brother Robert, would you like to ask another question? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, make sure that our bylaws aren't uh, are not. Not complying with constitutional law. No, they wouldn't be um, because they have in be terms of law. we have we have we have a provision. It says disqualification for holding office. Arrears for one year's dues shall disqualify a member for office, either elective or appointed. No member owing one year's dues shall be entitled to vote in an election of officers. The names of members entitled to vote to be read by the secretary immediately before such election. Uh, this was the tradition in Kilwinning Sons that, well, it was our law in uh, Kilwinning Sons at 936 and in AGDS all these years. We've had submitted these bylaws to Grand Lodge for right. approval. So if there was conflict with the constitutions, wouldn't we have heard about it yeah, by now? They wouldn't have been approved. That's why I say, by, if you look in the section where it says bylaws, the bylaws, again, is what rules and governs the lodge so long as they do not conflict with the general thing. So again, it's something that Steve is very familiar with because probably more so than I, having been a proctor. But that is, you know, the, that's the understanding I've had of uh, the bylaws in reference to the Constitution because they're submitted down to Grand Lodge for approval when you change or you, you, the bylaws, they are supposed to be, copies have to be sent to Grand Lodge for their approval and they're supposed to purview them so that it does not conflict with uh, Grand Lodge rulings. I, with, with all due respect, I don't think that, I mean, at least since I've been around and this is my 16th year now, um, it's actually not a requirement if you change your constitution, it's actually in Grand Chapter and Royal Arch it is. You, if you want to change your constitutions, but not in not in, in 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 Grand Lodge, but it is a nice service that if any if any lodge wishes to is, is amending their um, their bylaws and wants to submit them, the judge advocate will review them. Um, my brother Robert, I believe that I'm accurate. I'm going to double check that myself and try to get the word out there because I know the elections are coming up and I know that this is a, is a kind of a contentious issue. But once again, it, rather than beat the dead horse, because we're just really repeating what our yes. yeah, no, I, is at this I would point. appreciate it if 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 it turns well, out that, we'll that we aren't in compliance. To, to, to we're we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna put our heads together, and I would encourage you. We're going to put it out through the Craftsman Online email um, channel. So if you are subscribed to Craftsman Online, you will get it. And if you're not, then you have to subscribe. Otherwise, you're you're going to miss all at all the all the fun. Brother Marina, why don't you keep on moving forward? Thank it's you. Nine o'clock, but Brother Robert, absolutely, we'll get back to you. It's an important question, so thank you for raising it, as well as Brother Michael and, and everyone else. Brother Marina, keep on going because I don't want to. Um, it's already nine o'clock, and I don't. Well, want do you want me? Look, you know, look, let's be realistic. There's a lot more here, and I know a lot of the. But let, you know, if they would have questions, like, as I've said, please feel free to call me, email me, whatever. I have no problems with this. As Brother uh, John, uh, John server will tell you, uh, and Cliff, people have called me, uh, Brother Rob, Robert Remington have called. I have no problem, you know, 
answering questions. And if we're not sure, you know, uh, I, I I will not give you the wrong answer until I if until I check it. All right. There are certain things that I know I know, and there are certain things that if I'm not 100 percent sure before we would give it to you, we would clarify it because the one of the worst things you can do, and I will tell this to everybody, is that if you're not sure of something before you make an announcement or before you do something, try and get a positive definition or idea on it. Because once you say something or do something, it's like a domino's effect. Everybody seems to, you know, say, oh, I heard that by Joel, you know, and he may have heard something completely different. And it goes on. So for your own, you know, clarification, anytime you, you know, if there's something that you're not 100% positive about, or if you have a question, call Steve, call uh, Rich Bateman, call the, well, I'm not going to, don't call the Grand Secretary or the Grand Master or Deputy Grand Master. They got enough to do. All right. But you've got Rich Bateman down there. You, you've got people on the Education Committee. Like I told people, you want to call me? I have no problems with it. You want to email me? I'm in the book. I have no problems with that, but I'd rather see you get a clarification than do something that's wrong. My brother, uh, brother Marino, um, it's nine o'clock now, and I know that. I mean, we've really only scratched the surface. It's it's amazing how you know we've gone for an hour and a half now, and uh, you know we've only really just 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 you know just scratched it, and. Um, I know that we have another lecture planned um, in the future on different topics, but I would, I'm going to suggest that we, 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 we're going to pick a date and we'll, of course we'll advertise it and then we'll kind of continue this conversation moving forward because to me this is so important and just everyone should just know that you know, I've been saying for years now that um, our, it's, it's very challenging knowing and understanding our Masonic law. Um, you know, the, the book itself really does need to be updated and Brother Marino and I have, have discussed this over the last several years just because of our own um, busy schedules, you know, we've not been able to do that. I can tell you that right now, the Deputy Grand Master and um, it, it, there's, a, there's a small committee, I, I'm, I'm proud to be on it, that are looking at various constitutional provisions and these are the types of things that we are discussing going forward. But these are really gigantic ta tasks because as I've even said that the code of procedure could, needs to be addressed. And once again, that was the provision with respect to what governs Masonic trials, um, the, the codification of our, of our work. Once again, that blue book is just literally the codification of all the cases that have been discussed over the last hundred years or longer in our craft. And so I think that really the time might be to try to make it a little bit more easy, almost like a statute book that some other jurisdictions have already done so that you don't have to have a Masonic law degree to figure out all these things. Um, but it's wonderful having brothers that, that, that care so much and are, you know, and are so thoughtful about you know, how we govern our, our lodges that you're all attending tonight. But Brother Marino, do you want to just say some, some, some closing remarks and we'll, we'll close this down? And, and after you after you make a closing remarks, just bounce it back to me, and then once again, we'll we'll get everyone back on another date, so that we don't beat up, beat each other up too much tonight. Yeah, again, this, it's just basically the closing remarks. I just wanted to say that again, there's a lot to know, and it's important, especially the masses and officers, and even Grand Lodge officers, that they understand Masonic law, and that it keep uh, because it is what it keeps our fraternity on an even keel. Uh, Every master at his installation, like I said, is told to read and study and purview that book in large. And it's regrettably that they don't. That might be one of the things that keep brothers interested in the large uh, and, you know, ret for retention. You know, it's our, you know, I'm going to read what I put down here because it is our responsibility to ensure that the guidelines set forth by our forefathers are not misused or destroyed. The builders of this fraternity understood the minor changes and tweaks would be necessary as times change, but the basic concepts and principles found in our constitutions and Masonic law are strong and unyielding. We must not allow them to be changed 
so as to benefit the desires or wishes of a few and not that of our grand jurisdiction. It's up to you brothers to know that again, any questions you have, I'm more than happy to, you know, if you email me, like I said, I'm in the book, I'm uh, in, in a number of places. <laughs> uh, you're more than welcome to call, even call me on my cell, whatever. And if you have a question, if I can answer it, if not, I will definitely try and get you the correct answer. Again, Brother Marino, thank you, thank, thank you, you so much. You know, Brother Marino, everyone should know that Brother Marino, and I said this last time that he spoke, you know, he's one of those brothers that literally, that, that everyone from grandmasters to entered apprentices will, will call and he, and, and, he, and, he, and he volunteers his time and his knowledge and his intellect um, you know, you know, um, with, with love, it was brotherly love. And, and I want to just thank you so much, Brother Marino, for, for these programs that you're agreeing to do and just what you have done for the, for the craft these, these past 42 years. You are a true mentor to so many of us. And, um, and we thank you for your time, um, Brother Marino. Um, br Brother Bert, right where's Brother Bert, um, Maine, our, our, our wonderful, dear grand chaplain with a, with a sterling voice that, that, that we all love so much. We thank you, my, my dear Right Wishful Brother, for being here with us this evening. Um, it's it, your, your inspirational prayer got us started in the right place and it will carry us through for the, for the days to come. It's, it's such a pleasure seeing so many wonderful brothers you know, on this Zoom call. Um, I'm hopeful that this summer, once things open up even more, we'll have an opportunity to see each other, hopefully with a beer in our hands and a hot dog or, or, or in, in the other. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. I will just add that, you know, that this education, this learning goes on. Um, and the fact is that, you know, we have, you know, there's a lot more in front of us. Um, the modified Grand Lodge session will be taking place on, um, on, on Monday. And then we will have to wait for the Grand Master's decision when the, the, Grand, the, when the, Grand, when the Grand Lodge, the full Grand Lodge will, will actually be held. But it is incumbent upon each of us, um, whether you're the master of your lodge or not, to understand the rules, understand you know your powers and your authority. Um, as, I've, as I've indicated to so many brothers, that what brothers don't realize is that any worship master that walks into the Grand Lodge, any worship master that walks into the Grand Lodge walks in with more power than than the Grand Master or 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 any elected officer. Why? Because I, even as the Grand the elected Grand Treasurer. I have one vote. My, my, when I cast my ballot, it's, it, 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 it's, it's for one. As every worship master walks into Grand Lodge, you start off with three, the weight of three. And for every 50 additional um, members you have in your lodge, you get more weight to your, to your ballot. That's so it's a, it's a weighted ballot. So it, it truly is what governs our craft are our lodges. Um, and so recently you should have gotten a notification from the Grand Secretary's office that the um, Grand Lodge um, reports, really, I think for, probably for the first time since, I, since I've been a Master Mason, which is not as long as Bright Worship Brother Marino, but for quite some time, were actually disseminated before a Grand Lodge session. So I would like you to take the opportunity to really look at them and to read them through and, and to scrutinize whether it's the budgets or the reports themselves so while nothing will be acted upon them at this coming up Grand Lodge, this, this modified abbreviated session on Monday, but nevertheless, when you or your representative shows up to Grand Lodge, whenever it is held at the direction of the Grand Master, you will have a voice. You will, you will have some thoughts to say. You will have some questions to ask because you, what you are not, you, if you remember that you're not sheep, you're Master Masons. Um, once again, my brothers, I, I want to thank you for your time and attention and for your, for your care for the craft. God bless you all. God, God bless our, our, our wonderful country and God bless our craft. Be well, my brothers. <laughs>